Hey guys, welcome back to Popular Crime. This is Heather. And Joe. And we're back with another Under the Glass episode. In these episodes, we do some serious deep dives and examine different elements of a case. Today, we're looking under the glass at the abduction of Jamie Kloss. For those of you who are new to our Under the Glass episodes, these videos tend to go much longer than our regular videos. So we'll put timestamps in the description box down below if you guys just want to go to a specific topic in this case. And as is typical of these kinds of episodes, we go into more detail than what you'd get from a regular review of the case. We'll be showing video and playing audio related to the case, and some of it might be disturbing due to the situations depicted or the language used. For that reason, we want to make sure you know up front some of what we're sharing is explicit and you should use your own best judgment in watching this video. In particular, with this Under the Glass episode, we are going to look at some of the unusual circumstances in this case. As an example, the investigation was stymied by the absolute randomness of this kidnapping As we went through the case file that the Wisconsin Department of Justice's Division of Criminal Investigation made public, I was struck by how many leads they pursued that led nowhere. I think they had to run them all down because it was pretty obvious early on they didn't have any idea who did this or why. As a result, we're going to look at the crime itself, the investigation into it, the psychology of Jake Thomas Patterson, as well as some highlights from his sentencing. This case begins in Barron, Wisconsin. Barron is a very small town with a population of just over 3,300 people. It's about 90 miles northeast of Minneapolis, Minnesota, and about 60 miles northwest of Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Most of the residents in this area work at local factories, and it is considered to be a very safe town. Niche actually rates Barron the number one place to raise a family in Barron County. On a cool autumn night in 2018, a young man who was fixated on kidnapping a young girl shattered the sense of security for the people of this small town and destroyed a family without a hint of remorse. And the Kloss family had no idea about the kind of evil they were about to come face to face with. In the early morning hours of October 15, 2018, 13-year-old Jamie Kloss is sleeping, and she's woken up by her dog who's in her room with her. The dog's barking, and Jamie looks out the window and sees a vehicle pulling into her family's driveway. Immediately, something seems off. One, it's not quite 1 a.m., and this vehicle is approaching with their headlights off and in neutral, just coasting into the driveway to eliminate any noise. She immediately goes to her parents' bedroom and wakes them up. Her father, 56-year-old James Kloss, goes out to the living room and looks out the window, which you can see here. It's a decent-sized window, and he's looking out of it with a flashlight. Seeing a man with a gun approach the house, Jamie and her mother... 46-year-old Denise, run into the bathroom, lock the door, and barricade themselves in. They pull drawers out of a dresser so that they are up against the door, and they go into the bathtub to hide behind the shower curtain. James, still looking out the window, sees a man dressed head to toe in black, looking like a police officer in SWAT gear. This is 21-year-old Jake Thomas Patterson, and he is walking up the sidewalk to the home. He is wearing a black ski mask, or balaclava, and two pairs of some kind of work gloves. James is thinking it must be the police. Who else could it be? This is a small, safe town, and the Kloss family is your run-of-the-mill family. You know, regular good people. And in that, they have just all been woken up, and it's the middle of the night. They were very confused by what was happening. As Patterson continues to approach, he yells for James to get down on the ground. James goes to the door and looks out this small decorative window. He demands Patterson to show him his badge. At that point, Patterson demands that James open the door, and James doesn't even have an opportunity to react. Patterson immediately shoots James through the window on the door 
with a 12-gauge shotgun. He suffers significant trauma to his head and neck and is down on the ground fast. Patterson attempts to open the front door by ramming his shoulder into it multiple times, and when that doesn't work, he takes the shotgun and shoots through the door lock. You can see here the damage that was done from the shotgun. Patterson is able to make his way inside the house, steps over James, who is deceased on the floor in a pool of blood. Meanwhile, a 911 call is placed to the Barron County Sheriff's Department at 12.53 a.m. by Denise. As you can tell from the brief audio, you can't make out much of what Denise is saying. At first it sounds like she's saying someone is there, and then there's just a lot of screaming. And it's very possible that as she was on the call, the first gunshot had gone off that killed her husband. So let's take a look inside the Kloss house to get an idea as to where everything was during this attack. You can see where James is down here, right in the entranceway. And Patterson goes into all the rooms in the house looking for Jamie. And then he realizes that the only door that's shut is the bathroom. He goes to the door and he has to kick it and ram his shoulder into the door for about 10 to 15 times before he can get inside. He breaks down part of the paneling on the door and then he makes it inside. He then rips down the shower curtain and rod and throws it towards the hallway. He demands that Denise hangs up her cell phone and she won't do it at first and he grabs it from her and demands that she puts duct tape over Jamie's mouth and she doesn't do that either. So he puts the shotgun down on the sink and puts the tape over Jamie's mouth wrapping the tape around her whole head. Then he tapes her wrists together behind her back and also tapes her ankles together. According to Patterson's account, he grabbed Jamie, pointed the shotgun at Denise, and pulled the trigger while turning his head away and dragging Jamie out of the bathroom. And for perspective on how fast this all happened, Patterson estimates that he was only in the house for a total of four minutes. Patterson ends up dragging Jamie across the front lawn and puts her inside the trunk of his car, which is an older model red Ford Taurus. He removes his black ski mask and then proceeds to pull out of the driveway and head east on U.S. Highway 8. And he's on the road for about 20 seconds. And three police cars are driving west on Highway 8 towards the Kloss house. Remember, Denise had called 911 and that was at 12.53 a.m. And the sheriff's office had dispatched three deputies to the house because they had no idea what was going on there. Police likely thought it was a domestic incident with the screaming, but they have no idea what they're about to walk into. Now, like I said, Patterson has left the residence and didn't realize that the police department was only three miles away from the Kloss residence. When he sees the police coming, he doesn't panic at all. He yields to police and pulls over to the side of the road, acting like a normal, law-abiding citizen. All the while, Jamie's in the trunk, and Patterson later says that he had no idea what he was going to do if police had stopped him. He said he probably would have shot at the police. Let's take a look at all three police dash cams where you can see, as each of them drive by, Patterson is on the left side of the road, and all three deputies make note of a maroon, older-looking Taurus on the side of the road. But at this point, they have no idea if they're looking for a suspect driving or even what has happened at the Claus home. But they note it nonetheless. And one of the deputies notes that there isn't a front license plate on the vehicle. And Patterson had already thought ahead on what he could do to avoid being identified and he took many precautions, which we will get to in a little bit. So at this point, Barron County Sheriff's deputies have just reached the crime scene. It is now 1 a.m. From the time of the 911 call to Patterson committing these horrific crimes and the police arriving, it has only been seven minutes. And when they arrive, there are no lights on outside, no screaming 
or any signs of distress. They approach the house and begin their investigation. Meanwhile, Patterson, still driving east on Highway 8, is about to get onto US Highway 53 to head north to the town of Gordon, Wisconsin. This is about an hour or so away from Barron. He drives the speed limit all the way back to his home, where he will hold Jamie captive for a total of 88 days. Back to the Kloss residence. Police are about to enter the crime scene. We have the audio from the body cams when they got into the house, which we are going to play. Because it is only audio, we will make some notations on the screen as to what is happening so you can follow along. But I just want to warn you guys, you are going to hear the deputies respond to the crime scene as it is unfolding, which means they are going to find the victims in the house. So if that is something you are sensitive to, please skip ahead. We will be sure to note where the part after this picks up in the description box. Somebody's there. Go. Sheriff's office! Sheriff's office. Suicide. Sheriff's office! You don't know that. There were several voices. Sheriff's office! Who's inside? Watch our asses, John. Yep, I got your six. Yep. Get on the radio. Let them know. Have Baron swing out. Sheriff's Baron office! Baron. Announce yourself! It's possible suicide. If you want to let Baron PD swing out here as well. There's no, I don't see a gun, guys, so let's not write it off as a suicide. Okay. Let me run these 28s. And have EMS stage. Eric, you want you want him to cover this door? I mean, you go Have clear? EMS stage. Okay. Sheriff's yeah, office, if you're inside, yeah. announce! You gonna hold this for Baron PD? You got broken glass right there next to your elbow. There's a shotgun shell, but I don't see a shotgun. Go grab a long gun. Okay. One at a time. Yep. Quickly. Two shotgun shells. The store was open. Yep. This, this door, this glass door right here. I'm kneeling open. It was closed. Okay. John. Yep. I'm gonna hold this. You want to grab my shield? Get my keys off my belt right here. Yep. Right there. We're still missing a gun. We're missing a lot. Yep. Um, I'm gonna stand here until. Eric you got to have them advise through a 3301, one male down, deceased, still have the house to clear. 325. Several rounds spent. And 325. Notify 303 and 301, advise one male down, multiple rounds spent. You good? Yeah. 656317, where are you on me? I'm almost sir. I just need you outside covering us. We're going to go in and clear the house. You got a long gun on your anything? I got yeah. my rifle. Okay. Right, I'm sorry, no, I got my pistol. I'm sorry. Okay. If I got the shield, I'll take pistol. That truck's been here. It's got leaves on it. That one car was heading out as we were coming. Well, but they we'll have them on camera. Camera? Yep. Um... Couple things. But why is there a shell inside? Is that shell spent? Can you tell, Eric, the one down the hallway? Like well, just grab a long gun and just cover our entry here, okay? Just a quick guess would be this is the homeowner or the resident dead. We might be missing our suspect. I don't know. All right, do you want to use the shield or what? If that's okay Yeah, that's you. fine. I'll take rear. Do you want to get in front of him with the long gun? Um, are we... So what are we doing here? Are we step in or we're we... are going to clear the house best we can, safely. 317, remember, we're going to be clearing the house. Slow and steady? Slow and steady. Sheriff's office! I'm gonna hold right here if you want to clear left and right. 
I'm covering close. right. You want to here? Just both of you dip into the living room. Clear that completely. I'll cover all this. Right. Let him go first. Clear back here. Clear back here. Yep. Alright, Jay. Come on back up. No, hang on, Eric. Let him go. I'm gonna I'll keep covering this when, if you two want to duck in and start clearing these rooms. Go ahead. We got a hallway to our fuck. What? We got doors, we got hallways. Eric, cover. I'm going to break left, you cover this room to the right, okay? Okay, well, steady, boy. Cover that room. Yeah. Fuck, we got a dead body in this one. We got a body in here, too. <sighs> fuck. Do you see a shotgun? I do not. Okay. Okay, so. I can't clear this room yet. We got somebody pulling up here. But that, that can be Will's. Okay, um, I got, Eric, clear that room behind me. I got open closet. This is now a homicide scene. At 1.45 a.m., Detective Nelson arrives. He notes that the wooden front door was forcibly entered. The decorative glass on the front door was shattered, and the deadbolt locking mechanism on the door has heavy damage. The door has been shot open with a shotgun in the area of the deadbolt lock. Inside, he observes that James Kloss is deceased. He's lying on his back in an east to west direction, with his head partially under the kitchen table and chairs. He's also in front of a wooden entry door, and his legs are obstructing the full opening of that door. In the bathroom, he observes Denise seated in the bathtub, with her head lying against the lower section of the tub. The vinyl shower curtain and rod were on the bathroom floor and extending into the hallway. It's obvious from the crime scene that Denise had attempted to barricade herself and Jamie inside. Nelson notes that the assailant had forcibly breached the bathroom door. Part of the door broke and fell into the open drawer that's been barricading the door, and the door itself split prior to being forcibly opened. Denise's cell phone was lying screen side down on the floor near the hinge side of the bathroom door. Three 12 gauge shotgun shells are recovered from the scene. There's one on the ground outside of the residence next to the concrete steps by the front door. One is on the ground next to James and one is in the hallway floor in front of the bathroom. A tread pattern visible in blood is in the entryway of the front door next to James's body. They appear to be from tactical type boots and Patterson would later say that he remembered walking in the blood and almost slipping. While investigating the scene, Detective Nelson is informed that James and Denise have a 13-year-old daughter who lives at the residence, and she is nowhere to be found. A Wisconsin crime alert and an Amber Alert are issued immediately. So let's talk through the investigation for a few minutes. We can break the investigation into a few distinct phases. The response, the active investigation, and the ongoing search. Looking at the response, there is plenty to praise. Sheriff's deputies and local police were on scene within seven minutes of the 911 call to dispatch. Likewise, they acted smartly to secure the crime scene. Even though multiple deputies were heading to the scene, it made more sense to have as many people on scene as possible. So even though they literally passed the vehicle where Patterson had locked Jamie in the trunk, their decision to not have a single deputy peel off and interview a possible witness is defensible. Agonizing, but defensible. And it seems obvious from the dialogue, from the audio we played, while there were on scene, James Presley and John Fick knew this was a missed lead. Presley repeatedly tells both Fick and Eric Sedani that they were missing someone, and by that, I think he means the suspect. While Sedani was quick to dismiss the dead body of James Kloss as a suicide, Presley notes the lack of a gun, and the lack of a full picture. As they clear the house, they work to make sure that no one else is there, and again, Presley calls out when Fick discovers Denise's body, do you see a shotgun? 
What struck me was how calm he was. Based on what we showed from Niche earlier, Barron, Wisconsin, and Barron County in general, seem like they are relatively safe. I have to assume that this was an outlier scene for them. And even so, the response of these sheriff's deputies was solid all around. As they process the scene and await detectives, Presley sends Sedani to go back to the sheriff's office and look at his dashboard camera footage to see if they can pick up the license plate from the car that pulled over, trying to close that one loop that was left open. But due to Patterson's planning, even if they had picked up the plate, it wouldn't have mattered. Patterson had removed his own plate and substituted another. Not stopping him at that moment is the biggest and really only issue with the initial response. Deputies arrived quickly, moved with haste, and identified the obvious gap in their response. And they were right. Wanting to identify that vehicle was the miss that allowed Jake Thomas Patterson to hold Jamie Kloss as his prisoner. As solid as the response was, the active investigation languished. Despite multiple law enforcement agencies, Barron Police, Barron County Sheriffs, Wisconsin Department of Justice's Criminal Investigation Division, and the FBI participating, the lack of obvious leads left all these agencies grasping at straws. Typically, cops use our circles of connection to find suspects. They begin with our inner ring of closest confidants, our immediate family, our dearest friends. But with Jamie's mom and dad dead and her friends in middle school, what leads do they have to work with? Without an obvious connection, what did the investigators do to try and solve the case? Well, they immediately sought closed circuit footage of the most traveled highways away from Barron, which yielded nothing because both these cameras are well south of Barron itself, and Patterson, of course, headed north. And even if Patterson had been heading this way, it was dark enough that the footage was basically useless. Second, they followed up on every tip and lead they got, which included looking into family disputes. They talked to colleagues and co-workers and asked dozens and dozens of people hundreds of questions, all with the goal of unpacking the motive for this crime. Did someone want to do harm to the Clauses? Were James or Denise involved in anything problematic? Of course, it's an investigation, and inquiries about who might have possible motive is an obvious course of action. They talked to co-workers and pulled cell tower data and scan social media accounts, looking for anything that might give them a direction to focus their attention. In fact, there are over 1,600 pages of reports just from the Division of Criminal Investigation Officers related to the case. The majority of those pages generated within the first two weeks of the investigation, and sadly, the majority of them leading nowhere. And because most of what they uncovered were the proverbial wild goose chases, they peered into anything that might make some sense because there were no ties to Jake Patterson and the Kloss family at all. As a result, investigators spent almost three hours interviewing a man caught illegally entering the Kloss home after police had announced they had released it as a crime scene. The interview is just another investigative dead end but it sums up the futility of looking into a case without any credible, solid leads. You can't call it a waste of time, but the two officers got nothing of use towards finding Jamie Kloss, even though the strategy that snared Kyle Thomas Yankee Annis was sound. By leaving the house open but monitored, they hoped to catch the perpetrator returning to the scene of the crime, but instead they got a guy who followed the Kloss case closely and somewhat obsessively. Yankee Annis admitted that he should not have been there, but he was super intrigued by the case, and he took some clothing items that belonged to Jamie, while denying any involvement in the crime, and he only knew about the crime from the coverage of Jamie's disappearance. However, the full interview reveals so much more. It's absolutely bonkers, and includes several startling admissions that have absolutely nothing to do with Jamie Kloss. However, when you have nothing, you spend three hours talking to this guy. With the active investigation stalled, officials leverage the media in the ongoing search phase. The problem is that by the holidays, the case had grown colder than Black Friday turkey. Up to this point, 
Police were no closer to solving the case than they were on that first night. They were stuck. You can re-canvas witnesses, but no one saw anything of value. You can follow up on any of the hundreds of tips called in from all over the country, but they needed a miracle, or at least someone who knew something, to speak up. And even the media drumbeat slowed as time progressed. New crimes and new outrages overtook missing Jamie Kloss. Life went on, until she took the matter into her own hands and freed herself. She sure did. Fast forward to January 10th, 2019. 65 miles away up in Gordon, Wisconsin, Jeannie Nutter had been out for a walk and was just coming back to her cabin on Eau Claire Acres Circle when she came across a young girl on the road. It had been snowing and it was really cold outside. It was like 20 degrees. And this girl was not at all dressed for the weather. The girl yelled that she needed help and that she was Jamie Kloss. Immediately, she told Jeannie that Jake Patterson had killed her parents and abducted her. She said she wanted to go home and had no idea where she was. Jeannie recognizes her immediately and brings her over to a neighbor's house because her cabin was closer to the Patterson's. They make their way over to Peter and Kristen Kaczynska's home, and Kristen calls 911. Uh, no, I don't want to take her over. Douglas County 911. Hi. I have um, a young lady at my house right now, and she just says her name is Jamie Kloss. Okay. Have you seen her photo, ma'am? Yes. It Does is her. I 100% think it is her. Are you, okay. 100%. Does it look like she's going to run? No. She's sitting down. She's relaxing. Okay, hang on just a second. Now, the Kaczynskas have armed themselves in the event Patterson comes to their house looking for Jamie while they wait for police to arrive. When the police arrive, they observe Jamie wearing a pair of dirty men's New Balance sneakers. In her haste, Jamie put each sneaker on the wrong foot and just ran for it. Like I said earlier, Jamie wasn't really dressed for the weather. Her priority was to escape. All she had on were these sneakers, a pair of black leggings, a white tank top, thin socks, and a lightweight jacket. And officers described her as being in shock, tired, having matted hair and messy clothes. Police decide to remove Jamie from the Kaczynska's residence for safety reasons because they think Patterson may be attempting to locate her. And sure enough, while Deputy Dit Brender is driving away with Jamie in the car, they pass what appears to be Patterson's vehicle. And she asks Jamie if this is Jake's car, and Jamie doesn't know. She says that she thinks he has a Ford, but he also has other cars too. Dit Brender notifies Sergeant DeRosia of the red car that has just passed them. And police run the plate on the vehicle, and it is registered to a Katie Patterson. Sergeant DeRosia is down the road and he positions his vehicle in a way where he can observe the vehicle as it comes his way, and he observes a lone male occupant driving. The rear taillight is broken, and he also did not have a functioning rear license plate light. So DeRosia follows Patterson while waiting for another squad car driven by Sergeant Engelman, and Patterson drives past his home, which is just a few doors down from the Kaczynskas. He lives at 14166 South Eau Claire Acres Circle. DeRosia decides to conduct a traffic stop once Patterson passes his driveway. He then approaches the driver's side and Sergeant Engelman approaches the passenger side. Patterson is told to put his hands up and open his door. DeRosia asks Patterson what his name is as the door is opened and Patterson tells him. DeRosia tells him to step out of the vehicle, and as he does, Patterson says that he knows what this is about and that he did it. DeRosia asks him what he did, and Patterson says he wasn't going to say. So now that Jamie is safe and with police, and Jake Patterson has been apprehended, we begin to unpack exactly just what happened over the last 88 days. We're going to take a look at what happened in the aftermath of the murders and what happened while Jamie was held captive in Patterson's home. Then we're going to examine Jake Patterson himself because his psychology is fascinating and downright disturbing. And he tells police quite a lot. Now, we know from the investigation into this case that Jake Patterson didn't have any connection whatsoever to the Kloss family, and he didn't. One morning, while he was driving to work, he chose Jamie, having never met her 
or even knowing her name, solely based on seeing her one morning getting onto a school bus. This was truly a random crime inspired by obsession, not of a person, but of an idea of taking a young girl and holding her against her will. He became fixated on the commission of the crime and wasn't all that prepared for what happened afterwards. But before we get into all of that, let's talk about what happened in the immediate aftermath of the murders and abduction. So when Jamie arrived at Jake's house, he removed all the tape from her mouth, wrists, and ankles. She was obviously scared and had been crying. He made her disrobe and put her clothes into a bag, making a comment about not leaving any evidence. He said he was going to throw them away. He ended up burning her clothes along with the tape he had put on her and the gloves he wore during the murders. According to Jake, Jamie fell asleep that night in his bed and he slept on the couch. What I think people remember most about this case is where Jake kept Jamie. Now, Patterson lived by himself at his dad's house. His parents were divorced, and Patterson's dad actually lived in Duluth with his girlfriend because it was closer to where he worked. But he would come back to the cabin in Gordon on Saturdays. Most of the time, he would go home Saturday night, but sometimes he did stay over at the house. And Jake stated multiple times that he was never worried about his dad finding Jamie in his room because he never went in there. He said his father respected his privacy. He would allow her to be with him around the house and even outside in his yard because the houses were far apart. But whenever he had to leave, or if someone came over to the house, or if it was Saturday and his dad was at home, he made Jamie lay underneath his twin bed in his bedroom, which was on the top floor of the house. The clearance here is maybe two and a half feet and she would have to stay here, sometimes for up to 12 hours without a bathroom break, or food, or water. Patterson would put plastic tubs or totes up against his bed, basically enclosing her in this space. And he would put free weights and weight plates against the tubs and the totes so she couldn't easily get out, and so he would know if she tried to. When people came over and she was under the bed, he would put on music so that if she moved around, it would be difficult for anyone to hear her. His dad did tell investigators later that he did actually go into Jake's room once while he had Jamie in there to turn down the music that Patterson had put on. He described the room as trashed, and he never ever saw Jamie, or so he said. But how could he have? With all the tubs, totes, weights pushed up against the bed, it would have been impossible to see her trapped under there. Now, Jake Patterson often left the house. He would go grocery shopping for him and Jamie and drive out to his mother's house in Haugen, which is a good 45 minutes drive one way. And he would use her computer there to look for and apply to jobs. And he did this pretty regularly. Jake did not have a computer or Wi-Fi. He had a television, but he did not have cable, just a rooftop antenna, so they only got local channels. He had a burner phone, and he was able to look at news on it, but not much else. He left a minimal digital footprint, and we'll hear more about that when we talk about the precautions that he took before kidnapping Jamie and murdering her parents. Now, sometimes Jake would be gone for a long period of time, too. He spent Thanksgiving at a restaurant with his dad's side of the family. All the while, Jamie was stuck under his bed, trapped, unable to even use the bathroom when she needed to. On Christmas, Jake drove to Superior to visit his grandfather and his family. He enjoyed time with his family while Jamie was trapped under his bed, alone and scared. Jamie's extended family were experiencing the holidays for the first time without her, her mom, or dad. But what's even crazier is what is said in this article here from TwinCities.com. It reads, on December 30th, 2018, the whole Patterson family, Jake, his brother, his brother's girlfriend, his sister, father, and father's girlfriend, gathered for a belated Christmas celebration in Gordon as Jamie lay clustered upstairs beneath the bed of her abductor. At noon, Patrick Patterson suggested his three children pay a visit to their mother in Haugen. 
The couple had divorced in 2008. He told investigators his children returned to their home in Gordon around 4 or 5 p.m. As he later recounted the events of the day, the interviewers noted that, quote, Patrick stopped what he was saying and dropped his head, end quote, realizing aloud that he unwittingly had been left alone in the house with a captive Jamie for several hours. I can only imagine how horrible his dad felt about that day when realizing he could have done something. And honestly, from everything I've read about Jake's family, they are beyond horrified by what he did and feel horrible for Jamie and her whole family. And I had seen in the investigation reports that Patrick had actually gone to the police shortly after Jake was arrested, wanting to give the Kloss family a letter, basically apologizing for all that Jake did. And the detective said that he was shaking and crying and just really upset about all this. Jake destroyed a lot of lives by what he chose to do. It's just awful how much damage he did to everyone. Something else, though, that's crazy. When it came to keeping Jamie at the house, Patterson told police he didn't have any special locks on the doors or windows. He just trusted that she wouldn't leave because she was so scared of him. And he admitted having anger issues over small things. He said if he stubbed his toe or something, he would get really angry. He said these outbursts were what made her comply. Jamie said that Jake had hit her on the back with a handle of some kind of tool to clean blinds after he got mad one day. She doesn't remember what she did to make him mad. She said that he told her that if she did it again, her punishment would be worse next time. According to Patterson, on at least two occasions, he thought Jamie tried to get out from under the bed. He got angry and struck a wall and screamed to the point where he knew she was really scared and that she knew better than to try it again. He told investigators that they played board games and watched TV. He said that they did talk a lot, but never about the murders or her abduction. And on the Wikipedia page about this case, Patterson is quoted as saying, quote, We were just like watching TV, playing board games, talking about stuff. We cooked a lot. Everything we made was homemade, you know? Close quote. You know, and the way that quote sounds to me, it's just beyond creepy and delusional. Jake made it sound like they were in some kind of relationship, and maybe they were in his mind. Like, oh, we did this, we did that. He told investigators that he would stop at Starbucks for her while he was out and about and buy her her favorite drinks and stuff. And when police were questioning him, He was asked what his long-term plan was, and Jake actually said that the longer the time went, maybe he and Jamie could live a life together, and maybe after a year they could get an apartment together. Completely delusional. He said that when they talked and Jamie spoke of her parents, it was in the present tense, and he once said that they were watching TV and a news story came on about the murders and he was apologetic that she had to see that. But obviously Jamie was well aware of exactly what this monster did to her family. Now Jake also mentioned that two weeks after the abduction, Jamie started to eat again. He said she was a little more comfortable with him and the situation, which is pure fantasy on his part in my opinion. I don't think she was ever comfortable with him or the situation. How could she be? Jake also said that a week or so before the arrest, Jamie talked about missing school and her aunt who she was close with. Jake said she could write a letter to her aunt letting her know that she was alive and okay, but not to put any information about where she is or about Jake having taken her. He said that he had planned to take the letter to her aunt's house and leave it at the end of the driveway, but there was a big snowstorm, so he didn't go. And he hadn't planned on even putting the letter in the mailbox, which is just insane. He was literally going to throw it on the driveway. And that's what he said, and it makes zero sense. On the day Jamie escaped, Patterson told her he had to leave for five to six hours. He had actually gotten to the point where he felt so confident that Jamie wouldn't leave that he was going on a job interview. So he made Jamie go under the bed, as per usual. And after he left the house, Jamie decided that this was it. She had no idea where she was or how far other homes were from where she was. 
but she was going to make a run for it. She pushed the bins and the weights away, got out from under the bed, and made her escape. She threw on a pair of Jake's shoes and left the house. And we know when she saw Jeannie Nutter, she was safe and the police were called. Our friend Ron from Faces of the Forgotten covered this case as well and actually made the trip to the location where Jamie was held captive. We're going to take a look at Jamie's escape route from the Faces Forgotten Skycam. We're also going to link Ron's channel in the description box so you guys can check out his work as well. He visits all sorts of crime locations as well as the cemeteries of the victims in order to pay his respects. And this is a channel on YouTube that deserves so many more subscribers than it has. He is doing amazing work, so be sure to check out his channel. Let's take a look. And uh, this was uh, this was how she escaped right here. Uh, I can see the garage. And uh, he left her. He had her so terrorized he would he would leave. In fact, there were. Uh, Sometimes his parents would, uh, well, his dad would come over, I think, every, uh, every weekend. And uh, he had loud music playing in the, uh, the area where he was holding her, down in the basement, under the bed in the barricade. And uh, he, he didn't, never knew. And uh, she would never leave. Well, finally, he left for a couple hours, and she got up the courage, and she... Uh, she ran out in the snow. All she had on was her tights, um, some type of sweatshirt, I think, 20 degrees out. And she had um, his, uh, uh, his, his gym shoes on backwards and uh, ran down here. Um, and that's where uh, the story gets better. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find a place and I'm going to try and send up the face of Skycam so we can have a uh, try to get a feel for what it was like uh, and a little better view of things also. So let's take another look at this from above from the Skycam as we come in here. So again Jamie was too scared she was too terrorized to try to escape but there came a day on the 87th day or the 88th day where uh, Jake said, hey, I'm going to be gone for two hours. Don't you go anywhere. Don't try to escape, as usual. But this is the time that she made her move. And uh, even though she was trapped under the bed with all the weights and the bins and walled in, she pushed them out and she uh, came out of this door right here. It was 20 degrees. It was snowing. Made her way down the driveway and then took off. She may have made a left. She may have made a right. But all I know, all we know, is she ran into Jeannie Nutter, who was the dog walker. Now, Jeannie had experience in social work and also some psychology, and she knew how to keep Jamie calm, and uh, she asked some basic questions, and then, like, what color is the car in case we see it, and then let's hightail it to a safe place. They ran down the road, just like you see here, and at the end of the road here, at the corner, there's a house owned by Peter Kasinkas, and they took a right in here, went into the house, uh, barricaded themselves in there with the family, and they called 911. Now, Jamie is a true survivor. She had incredible courage, and at only 13 years old, had the presence of mind to do everything she could to stay alive and finally make her move to break free. Her escape is just incredible. Shortly after this whole ordeal, she was reunited with her family and friends who were just elated to have her back home. And now we have Jake Patterson, who by all accounts never presented any red flags that he was capable of killing two innocent people and ripping their child away from them in the middle of the night. So how did he go from A to Z so fast? Before we dig deeper into who Jake is, Let's talk about what happened leading up to the murders and abduction. On the evening of January 10th, 2019, when Jake was arrested, the police interviewed him, and he immediately tells them everything. He confessed to killing James and Denise Kloss and kidnapping Jamie. He had worked at Saputo Cheese Factory for two days before quitting, 
and this is a common pattern in his employment history, which we will talk about in a little bit. But on the drive to work, one of the two days he was working there, he stopped behind a school bus on US Highway 8, where he watched Jamie get onto the bus. He had no idea who she was, who lived at her house, or how many people were in the house. He didn't even know her name or age, but he is adamant about how when he saw her, he knew that she was the girl he was going to take. He said taking her was all he thought about while at work. Jake said that on that second and last day at Saputo, he purchased the black balaclava mask from Walmart in Rice Lake to conceal his identity before taking Jamie. Now, this is early October, and he murdered Jamie's parents and kidnapped her on October 15th. So he has plenty of time to plan things out and reconsider committing these crimes. And plan he did, but reconsider he didn't. And from that initial thought of taking this young girl who he didn't even know, Jake became fixated on doing this. He tells police that he was determined to take Jamie that night and he was going to kill anyone that was in the house because he couldn't leave any witnesses behind. Initially, Jake told the police that he kept his shotgun around him at all times after committing the crime because he was worried that police were going to find him. But a couple weeks had passed and he assumed that he had gotten away with it. And he says he didn't know who Jamie even was until after the abduction. He said he learned the names of the people he murdered through news reports on TV and social media. Jake stated that he never would have been caught if he would have planned everything perfectly. Yeah, you know, it's interesting that Jake mentioned social media because he didn't have any accounts, but perhaps he was lurking around Twitter or Facebook just following the story. But in many ways, he planned things out perfectly. He selected a victim he had absolutely no connection to whatsoever. And it was as random as you can get. But once he decided that Jamie was the girl that he was going to take, he executed things really well. And when someone commits this kind of random, horrific act, we turn to criminal profilers to attempt to make sense of what they did. On PostCrescent.com, a former special agent from the FBI weighs in on Patterson. This is outside the norm, said Greg McCrary, a former special agent with the FBI who had a long association with the National Center for the Analysis of Violent Crime and was among the early criminal profilers. McCrary, noting the brutality of the killings, said Patterson was determined to follow through on his plan to kidnap Jamie. He went to the Kloss home twice before October 15th, but he saw several cars parked outside and the lights on inside the home and decided to wait, according to the criminal complaint. He saw her at the bus stop and then he engaged in predatory behavior. Then he began the hunt, McCreary said, recounting the details in the complaint, which police say Patterson provided in a confession. How do you conceptualize a guy like this? He's impulsive on one side, but he's more ritualistic. He has no qualms about killing the parents. They were just obstacles in the way to have at this young girl. Patterson had no criminal record before his arrest, but McCreary said that's not the unusual part about this crime or the man accused of committing it. Almost always, those guys don't have a criminal history and it's one big explosive event. This could be somewhat similar to that, he said. And then McCreary observes narcissism in Patterson, which is very obvious in his comments about how he thought he could just murder Jamie's parents in front of her, kidnap her, hold her captive and terrorize her. And then, you know, at some point they would just get an apartment together and live their life together. But continuing with the article, McCreary also sees signs of narcissism in Patterson. He noted when stopped by police on January 10th, he said, I did it. and went on to say in his confession that he assumed that he had gotten away with his crimes and claimed he never would have been caught if he had planned the abduction perfectly, the complaint said. He talks about being criminally sophisticated and his efforts at not being detected. He likes to brag about it, which is extremely pathological, McCreary said. 
He thinks he's smarter than anybody else. And he was just getting off on this. He had this secret, which reinforces his feelings. He has a captive in the house and appears to lead a normal life. It's the narcissism that is often their vulnerability, such as the confidence to go out and leave Jamie alone. He got overconfident in his ability to maintain this. Another place where Patterson showed excessive narcissism was in dealing with the press. Within the documents collected by the Division of Criminal Investigations, we found a letter that Lou Raguse of CARE 11 sent to Patterson with several questions. Let's be specific on timing. This letter was sent on the 19th of February in 2019. So this is before he's pled guilty and before he was sentenced. And amazing to me, Patterson responded with the same kind of nonsense that he said to the interrogators. Let's go through one of the questions with his response. Patterson's handwriting is not exactly easy to read. So if we have something wrong, please feel free to let us know in the comments below. But this is what it looks like to me when I was reading it. So the question from Ragus. Why did you confess when you were caught? And why did you confess in such detail? And the answer, I knew when I was caught, which I thought would happen much sooner, I wouldn't fight anything. I tried to give them everything. Wasn't completely honest. So they didn't have to interview Jamie. They did anyways and hurt her for no reason. There is so much there. He's claiming the moral high ground in that he gave police everything. But he wasn't completely honest, just, just to be clear, wasn't completely honest. That's crazy on its face. And then he blames the police for hurting Jamie Moore. This isn't just delusional. This is a malignant narcissism that makes him the hero of this little story, a story in which he took two people's lives and held a young girl prisoner for almost three months. And the planning he put into this shows that he really thought about what he was doing and decided to do it anyway. I think malignant narcissism is the best way to describe it. I have no doubt that he actually believes that by confessing to the police that he was doing something helpful or some kind of favor for Jamie. But I want to go back to him saying that he drove to the Kloss home twice with the intention of kidnapping Jamie. He did this sometime between quitting Saputo Cheese and one to one and a half weeks before he went through with his plan to kidnap Jamie on the 15th. He said he was scared off by the cars in the driveway the first time and the lights being on and people walking around the house the second time. However, I believe that the first two times he went to Jamie's house, he was actually scoping things out. Now, Patterson told police that he wanted to get Jamie fully under control for a week before his dad came home on a Saturday. And that second attempt was on a Friday night. So I don't believe for a minute that he would have had her at the house early Saturday morning when his dad was going to be there in a few hours. Exactly. Let's make an assumption. For a little bit of background, we learn in his confession that Patterson had enlisted to become a Marine. And I am certain his desire to be a Marine followed a devotion to the Corps. People who want to be Marines know what they are getting into. They want to be among America's most elite warriors. They are willing to put the good of their unit and the Corps ahead of everything else in their life. And they are willing to endure 13 weeks of pure hell in basic training. No one joins the Marines on a whim, or if they do, they get out very quickly. So if we accept that Patterson knew what being a Marine entailed, it also follows logically that he studied aspects of warfighting. And that's why I feel confident saying his two other trips were recon missions. He wanted to be familiar with the terrain, so when he drove it the morning of October 15th, it would be easier for him to move quickly and calmly to his objective and to escape successfully. I will talk more about Patterson and the Marines in a little bit, but prior to his third and final trip to kidnap Jamie, Patterson drives a few miles down the road on County Highway D near Serona, and he steals license plates so he wouldn't be spotted with his own. 
he only put the rear license plate on and this explains why Barron police couldn't see a plate on Patterson's car when he pulled over on the night of the murders. And while Patterson says that he is impulsive and has a problem thinking things through, he really didn't when executing these crimes, which again suggests that his obsession and fascination was more about committing the act itself and having someone basically being a prisoner in his own house than it was about what would happen in the aftermath. That's correct. He made several modifications to his car to ensure he could approach stealthily. Well, let's run them down quickly. So first, he removed and disconnected the dome light in the vehicle so opening the door wouldn't illuminate the interior. Likewise, he disabled other interior lights in the car and finally, he removed the trunk light and the glow-in-the-dark kidnapping cord so the trunk release couldn't be opened. Now, first and foremost, this suggests a mechanical inclination. We don't see many questions about it, but I would say that he was fairly handy with the different um, items around the house or the car or what have you. Further, he understood, either from study or from some other means, the basics of a forensic investigation. And let's start with some obvious considerations. He used his dad's 12 gauge Mossberg pumps shotgun because it was a common gun and he thought it would be harder to trace. He had six 12 gauge shotgun shells described in the complaint and the confession as being slug shells from an ammo box in the garage and believed that it would inflict the most damage on someone. He wiped down the shotgun shells while wearing gloves and cleaned and wiped down the shotgun while wearing gloves so there would not be any fingerprints or DNA. Then he loaded the shotgun with the shells while wearing gloves. He shaved his face and head hair so no trace would be left. Likewise, he showered before leaving. He wore two pairs of work gloves on each hand. He wore the balaclava, black colored jacket and jeans to make him more difficult to see in the dark. And then finally, brown colored leather steel toed work boots and all these precautions show that jake was very organized and focused because he was fixated on committing the crime itself i don't think he spent much time thinking beyond this act once he brought jamie back to the house he didn't have any clothes for her or anything his sister had clothes in the house that jake gave her i agree but i want to break down a few choices he made that showed just how committed he was so let's start with a gun. Patterson is right. Mossberg pump shotguns are very common and quite popular. Likewise, without the rifling, there are no ballistics on the slugs or shot, which makes them harder to link to a specific crime. So shotguns are remarkably lethal weapons, but they have some very obvious limitations. Because they don't have rifled barrels, shells are not as accurate. This is minimally important if you're using shot. Whether it's number nine birdshot or double lot buck, the shells typically loaded into a shotgun will disperse a number of small metal spheres at a high rate of speed. And what they lack in accuracy, they make up for in field of fire. But the further you are from your target, the less powerful the impact. Slugs, on the other hand, counteract that. They are a single lump of metal fired from the barrel. Typically, they weigh about an ounce, and most are designed to spin in such a way that they improve the accuracy. But they are hardly ideal for home defense because they require good aim. But if you are close up, like Patterson was, they are accurate, powerful, and difficult to trace to a specific weapon, planning, organization, and commitment to succeeding at his mission to take this girl. Right, all of Jake's energy was spent on the commission of the crime itself, not what he would actually do if he succeeded in kidnapping her, like we've said. And yet he seemed to think that somehow after all of this, and I know I am stuck on this because it's just absolutely bonkers, he and Jamie would get an apartment together and just live together as if nothing happened at all. That's right, he focused just on the act, which says a lot about its importance to him. And from what we saw in the response phase of the investigation, in spite of exceptional response from the sheriff's deputies, Patterson pretty much got away clean. So before we get into the interrogation, 
let's look at the way that he executed the crime. He was precise and capable and moved without hesitation in a situation that as much as he planned for, he could never simulate the visceral way a person responds in that kind of high stress situation. I mean, just take a look at the emotions that would have gripped any normal person. Approaching a home, it's late. These people might be armed. Patterson has no idea. This creates several feelings, but fear, fear ought to be one of them. He's the aggressor, obviously, and this will create a sense of anticipation. Additionally, he is experiencing an intense fantasy. In his own words, something he had thought about for a long, long time. That, to me, is going to indicate a sign of intense arousal in what he was doing. So that's a ton of emotional response, and yet he moved swiftly, efficiently, and with precision. He describes it in the interrogation as something to the effect of, quote, I wasn't thinking, you know, that much, end quote. This is very similar to what performance gurus describe as a flow state. Flow is a mental state where a person is so immersed in whatever task they are engaged in that they feel a burst of energy and steady focus. And oftentimes, flow requires a balance between two seemingly contradictory states, both confidence in your ability, coupled with the challenge of pushing yourself to go beyond what you have done before. Now, Jake said that he never abducted anyone before or even shot anyone. And he said that he didn't have much firearms experience. But he did say that he had had thoughts of abducting a girl for a couple of years. And after reading the 62-page transcript of Jake's interview with police, we made a list of what we learned about him. So let's take a look at what we have. Now, Jake knew that the thoughts he had about kidnapping a young girl was not normal, and he had been repressing them for a few years. He specifically said, quote, I was more thinking I could kidnap a girl and just like keep her end quote. He also said that he had thoughts of how would I be able to get away with kidnapping a girl? And in his mind, the only thing that he could think of to accomplish this was a home invasion. And he admitted to the police that his thoughts about taking a young girl before he committed these crimes had a sexual component, but because he, and in his words, felt so terrible about what he did, he couldn't do anything and says after that, he really didn't want to do anything like that with Jamie. Which in my opinion is a very convenient thing he can say to law enforcement when he's in that room. Agreed. But he said that he thought about killing people and taking someone from their house, and it had been in his head for six months to a year prior to taking Jamie. And he says he's not sure what triggered it. Perhaps it was spending so much time doing nothing. And then he said he just wanted a young girl. He wasn't interested in girls his age. And he said he didn't want a kid kid, but you know, 13, 14, 15, which by the way, Jake is still a kid. And furthermore, in 2016, that's when he said that he started to think more specifically about how he would take a girl. And he also noted that there wasn't anything specific that drew him to Jamie. And further went ahead and said that he didn't even really see her, that he thought she was younger than she was and that she had brown hair. And it makes me ask, how well did he really even see her? How did he know that this is the girl that he was going to take when, you know, if he, if he had to, he probably couldn't have even picked her out of a lineup. Right, I think it could have been anyone. Yeah, and that's pretty much what we can conclude. But continuing with our list, and I know it's all over the place, but so is that interview. But he said that he felt instant regret and he couldn't believe that he had actually done this. Jake said he never sought help for these thoughts that he had or saw a mental health professional, and he wasn't on any medications. Jamie kept asking him, how long she was going to be there. And he said that he would probably let her go in a year. 
Patterson also claims he's a nice guy most of the time, <laughs> but he does note that he gets really angry over small things. He claimed that he could never kill her or hurt her, and he said that he felt that Jamie could have slipped away if she had really wanted to, which is just crazy. And he said no one knows about his anger issues and he has never gotten help for it. Continuing on that, that line, he said he tried to cut her hair once to change her appearance, and she really cried, saying she didn't want him to cut it, so he didn't. And further, Patterson said he, that after a while, he thought that he could really get away with this. When there is no connection to someone, it's almost impossible to solve these crimes. And then, one of the things that's also interesting, that he was the first car stopped behind the bus that day. So it really was a very random kind of a thing. Yeah, and again, like he had said earlier, um, you know, he really didn't know anything about her. Or even see her. Or see her, really, you know. So it's as random as you get. But he also said that he never thought to do this specifically with other young girls. He said the one thing that really bothers him about getting caught, and by the way, this is the thing I actually believe, is what his parents will think of him. So it's not it's not kidnapping Jamie. It's not blasting her parents with a shotgun. It's what his parents are going to think of him. It's letting down mom and dad. Right. And being in the Marines is what Jake really wanted to do more than anything else. And like I said, we'll get to that in a little bit. And there is literally nothing else he said he wanted to do. So he had zero motivation to do anything else. And he says that after he came back from the Marines, after he got honorably discharged, that is when he first had thoughts of taking a girl. Now, one of the other things that we learned is that the police ended up taking about 89 pieces of evidence from the Patterson's property. And Patterson himself admitted that he did smoke weed on occasion and that he had recently started drinking vodka. Yes, and he claimed that when the police asked him if he had given any to Jamie, he said, oh, I offered, but, you know, she didn't want any. So basically, I respected that. How kind. <laughs> yeah, very kind. Okay, so that's what we got from the interview. And it's, it's a lot of information and it doesn't always connect very neatly. But there are some things that I, I thought were pretty consistent with Patterson throughout the interrogation. And it's pretty clear he's lying overtly throughout this. But he's giving investigators enough for them to get what they want, which is a conviction. I mean, here's an obvious lie. He claims that he is not well-versed with guns. And I think this is laughable. Again, guy wants to be a Marine, doesn't know a lot about guns. Another theme in the confession is the selective disclosure. Yes, he admits that, that he killed the Klosses and he took their daughter, but he holds his motives and the means of executing this crime so close to the chest. And that is really interesting to me. He reveals that he was smart. Look at everything I did to inhibit your collection of evidence. Look at how easily I got away with this. Look at me. I mean, that's narcissism, but him choosing not to reveal everything is like him savoring or preserving certain aspects of the act just for himself. It's completely sick. Yeah, and it's like what that um, special agent McCrary was saying. You can tell. As he talks to the cops, he is trying to slow play them. Oh gosh, I was just a D or a C student. Oh, I didn't know guns all that well. Oh, I felt so guilty about what I did to Jamie's parents that I apologized to her. So let's get into his contradictions because he's had a lot of them in his confession. In the first one, I thought about this for years, but I made no plans for what I would do if I successfully executed this. Then, I had sexual fantasies, but I never acted on them. Further, I wanted to take the girl, but I did not plan to kill her parents, which he contradicted by saying that he would kill anyone who got in his way. Then, I brought a shotgun, but I handled it amateurly, and I still managed to fire three shots and kill two people. So, 
let's be clear, I talked about this before, he quickly and efficiently took two lives and kidnapped a third person using ammo that requires well-aimed shots while claiming to not have a lot of firearm experience. That's just crazy talk. And he doesn't want investigators to know what the deal was. He wanted to keep those things to himself. And that signals that this act, the conception, the planning, and execution is deeply important to him, which to me suggests highly sociopathic mind. Further, doing all of this allowed him to avoid conviction for any crimes that he committed against Jamie in Douglas County. His confession and his guilty plea were focused on the night of October 15th. The 88 days between then and Jamie's escape in January, he got away with anything and everything that he did. But let's talk a little bit about the things that we know about Patterson that predates all of this. Yeah, so after high school, Jake went into the Marines and went to training in San Diego. He was there for about two and a half to three months, and he was having some medical issues while in training. And a doctor there discovered that he had a heart condition, and he would not be able to stay in the Marines. So he was honorably discharged from there, and just had a very difficult time dealing with the disappointment that he felt about that. And he says that it was after that that he started having those thoughts about abducting a girl. Now, once Jake returned home from San Diego, he worked multiple part-time jobs. And he had this strange pattern with these jobs. Like he would get hired somewhere and not show up. Or he would work a shift or two and just quit. Never even telling anyone at the company that he wasn't coming back. And Jake had put all of his energy into being a Marine. And when that wasn't possible, he was just lost. Jake's dad was helping him by paying all the utilities at the house. And he gave him money every week for groceries and gas. But obviously he wanted him to find a job. But let's take a look back to Jake's high school years. He attended Northwoods High School in Minong, Wisconsin and graduated in 2015. He was incredibly smart and he was always reading books. But, like he said, he was a C or D student. A former teacher that he had for years said that his grades were low because he just didn't like doing homework. Back in 8th grade, Jake wrote for the school newspaper. He was a delegate in the spelling bee and a member of the quiz bowl team. Now, Jake was well liked in school, but he didn't participate in his senior class trip to Florida or even attend his graduation, but he did have friends that he hung out with. He just didn't like huge groups of people. He would often spend his lunch period at school in his teacher's room, along with other students, so he could use the Chromebooks there to check out news. Jake did not have any girlfriends in school or was ever in any kind of dating relationship. He said that he liked girls and could talk to them, but he was quiet and shy. And his preference, like he said before, was for younger girls rather than girls his age. A teacher said that there was a girl in class who had asked him to prom, but he had said no. And she also noted that there was a girl in his senior yearbook who he was friends with in high school who had an eerie resemblance to Jamie Kloss. And I tried to locate this yearbook, but I could not find it. He graduated in a very small class, so I don't think their yearbook is online. All right, tell us about one of his friends. I think this person did an interview about when he knew Jake. Yeah, so the interview was in an article on Wisconsin Public Radio. And Dylan Fisher, who was friends with Jake in high school, said that Jake was a bit introverted and that he kept to himself. But there were no red flags that he saw. He said Jake had morals, who loved his parents and dog. He was smart. He liked to joke around. And he said that Jake was disheartened by his parents' divorce and the path that his brother had taken. He also said that Jake didn't want to keep in touch after high school and he had no social media accounts, so that friendship pretty much fizzled out. But ironically, while Jamie was being held captive, Jake actually ran into a girl that he had been friends with since fourth grade outside of his house that December. 
And this friend said that Jake was funny, he was a good person, who was always there for her. She would hang out with him outside of high school with a group of friends. They'd go swimming and fishing and hang out at Minong Park. And her mom lived down the road from Jake. And one night in that December, she saw him outside near his mailbox when she was driving around looking for her family's lost dog. And when she came across him, she said that he came over, he hugged her, he seemed excited to see her, they chatted for a little bit, and then she went off to look for the family dog, and that was pretty much it. But there was nothing strange or weird, he didn't seem off, he didn't seem nervous, nothing. Yeah, and he didn't obviously confess that he had Jamie locked up in his bedroom under the bed. Obviously, obviously. There's a lot to talk about here, and to me, Patterson feels off just from the start. We don't know a lot about him. He had a minimal internet presence, average student who, in his own words, didn't really try. He had that dream to become a Marine, but an undisclosed medical issue caused him to be honorably discharged. I know in his interview, he said that uh, it was a heart issue, but I haven't seen anything that corroborates that statement. And you might think, well, he would know, but we have no reason to take Jake Thomas Patterson at his word. Killing two people and stealing their daughter in the middle of the night is enough for me to seek confirmation, even if he were to tell me that the sun rises in the east. Was there anything else in his background that would tell us he would do something like this? Would we even know it if we saw it? But from his actions, his words, and his interactions with people, we can piece together a sketch of who this guy is. His actions indicate a deeply pathological individual. While he maintains that he felt guilty for what he did, and I cannot speak to his true thoughts, I will say, ruthlessly killing two people by blasting them in the head with shotgun slugs is a sign of someone who does not care about other people. Moreover, he planned with equal fervor. Let's look at the step he, steps he took related to this. First, he took those two preliminary trips to the Kloss home. And we talked about this. He said he chickened out, but in reality, he was conducting reconnaissance on his targets. As someone who aspired to be a Marine, Patterson learned in his brief time in boot camp certain elements of martial life. He didn't just desire to be a Marine. He wanted that more than anything in his life until he discovered Jamie Kloss. What I see in Jake Patterson is a committed individual, highly organized, clearly the parts that allow people to see others with empathy or compassion are lacking in him. His guilty plea was intentional and designed to ensure the prosecution didn't go after him for other crimes. And frankly, the DA took the win and moved on, knowing he would spend the rest of his life in prison. And we haven't touched on the obvious considerations with Patterson, obsessiveness, impulsive behavior. I've seen in various forums that they've called him an incel. I think this is incorrect. I think instead of an involuntary celibate, Patterson was voluntarily celibate. I think he channeled those drives and desires into pursuing something more satisfying to him than companionship or sex. Moreover, I think he needed something he could never provide for himself, which also motivated him in this. It feels like he's institutionalized. I couldn't say how that came about. Look at his path, though. From the tight regimentation of high school, into the military, which has an even greater degree of regimentation than high school, to aimless drifting, unable to hold down a job, or basically being lost in life during that stretch. Then he found purpose. He abandoned his morality and committed to something. He pulled it off, and now, after all of this is over, he's going to spend the rest of his natural life in the most regimented world imaginable, maximum security prison looking over his shoulder for when someone decides it's his turn. Yeah, inmates really don't care for people who hurt children. And while he was in a prison in New Mexico, he got into a fight that was captured on camera, and he's been moved often for safety reasons. And in the process, he has become friends with other notorious and reviled killers like his Bible study best buddy, 
Chris Watts. So by Jake Patterson pleading guilty, there wasn't a dramatic trial. This case actually moved fast in our judicial system. On Friday, May 24th, 2019, Jake Thomas Patterson was sentenced for the murders of James and Denise Kloss, as well as Jamie's kidnapping. Let's listen in to Jamie's victim impact statement being read. Attorney Chris Gramstrup. Gramstrup. If you'll state your full name, then spell both your first and last name. Chris Gramstrup, C-H-R-I-S, G-R-A-M, S-T-R-U-P. Go ahead. Judge, this is the statement of Jamie Kloss. Okay. Last October, Jake Patterson took a lot of things that I love away from me. It makes me the most sad that he took away my mom and my dad. I loved my mom and dad very much. And they loved me very much. They did all they could to make me happy and protect me. He took them away from me forever. I felt safe in my home and I loved my room and all of my belongings. He took all of that too. I don't want to even see my home or my stuff because of the memory of that night. My parents and my home were the most important things in my life. He took them away from me in a way that will always leave me with a horrifying memory. I have to have an alarm on the house now just so I can sleep. I used to love to go out with my friends. I loved to go to school. I loved to do dance. He took all of those things away from me too. It's too hard for me to go out in public. I get scared and I get anxious. These are just ordinary things that anyone like me should be able to do, but I can't because he took them away from me. But there are some things that Jake Patterson can never take from me. He can't take my freedom. He thought that he could own me, but he was wrong. I was smarter. I watched his routine and I took back my freedom. I will always have my freedom and he will not. Jake Patterson can never take away my courage. He thought he, control, he could control me, but he couldn't. I feel like what he did is what a coward would do. I was brave and he was not. He can never take away my spirit. He thought that he could make me like him, but he was wrong. He can't ever change me or take away who I am. He can't stop me from being happy and moving forward with my life. I will go on to do great things in my life, and he will not. Jake Patterson will never have any power over me. I feel like I have some power over him because I get to tell the judge what I think should happen to him. He stole my parents from me. He stole almost everything I loved from me. For 88 days, he tried to steal me, and he didn't care who he hurt or who he killed to do that. He should stay locked up forever. Judge, those are the words of Jamie Kloss, and it's been my privilege to deliver them to you. Thank you. Before Patterson's sentencing, Judge James Babbler said that Patterson was, quote, the embodiment of evil, close quote and how, quote, there is no doubt in my mind that you are one of the most dangerous men to ever walk on this planet, close quote. As part of the plea deal, prosecutors dropped the armed burglary charge and agreed not to charge Patterson with any crimes related to Jamie's captivity in Douglas County. So some details of what Jamie went through during that time may never be released. However, we do know that on the day Patterson pled guilty, which was March 27, 2019, he was placed on the sex offender registry. Jake did have an opportunity to address the court before being sentenced. Let's listen in on what he had to say. 
Mr. Patterson, is there anything you wish to tell the court before I impose sentence? Yeah. <clears throat> I'll just say that I would do like absolutely anything to take back what I did, you know. I I would die. I would do absolutely anything to to bring them back, you know. I don't care about me, I just, I'm just so sorry, that's all. So the Green Bay Press Gazette summarized what the judge said about the pre-sentence investigation. A pre-sentence investigation revealed statements Patterson made, which Babbler read, show Patterson entertained fantasies of holding a young girl prisoner before he found Jamie. He tried to suppress them, fearful of going to hell, but eventually abandoned his Christian values. Before he saw Jamie, Patterson said that he would drive around trying to get lucky and find a girl who was alone, according to Babbler. Patterson knew that he didn't want to leave behind evidence or witnesses. When he saw Jamie, he decided she would be a good target. Quote, I also just wanted to scare people, end quote, Patterson said, according to Babbler. Quote, I hated everyone but no one in particular, end quote. As Babbler read from the investigation report, Patterson shook his head vigorously. So Jake goes away for the rest of his life, and even that seems too light of an outcome. Let's remember, in all of this, he destroyed a family. Both James and Denise made the ultimate sacrifice to protect their only child, Jamie. And her experience, witnessing her mom and dad being killed, taken by a narcissistic psychopath and held captive. She said she never wanted to go back to her old home or see her old stuff. Her victim impact statement highlights how much Jamie's life was shattered by all of this. But this is all the information we have at this time on this case. Again, special thanks to our friend Ron at Faces of the Forgotten and to all of you who have watched this video. We really appreciate all of you. Please give it a like and share it with anyone who you think would appreciate this kind of in-depth review of this case. Likewise, we're working on more in-depth reports like this, so make sure you subscribe, and if you want to know when we drop new videos, hit the bell for all notifications. Until our next video, stay safe, keep investigating, and, and we'll, we'll see, see you soon. soon.